everybody. In this episode, we're going to talk about chapter two of season one of Discovery, and this is where things get wild. That's right. Discovery season one, episode 10, Despite Yourself. Welcome everybody to Trek in Time, where we're watching every episode of Star Trek in chronological order and putting it to context at the time of original broadcast. So we're looking at things going on in Discovery, which means we are just now entering literally like by the thinnest of margins, we're into 2018. Doesn't seem that long ago, but as we get into some of the details about what was going on in that year, it feels a lot longer than (laughs) anybody could imagine. Yeah. And who are we? I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some stuff for adults. I also write some stuff for kids, like my recently released The Sinister Secrets of Singe, which is an adventure book involving robots, mad scientists, and pirates. I hope you'll be interested in checking it out. And with me is my brother, Matt. He's that Matt of Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And on your book, and it's going to be a little late notice for this podcast again, but your book reading in the New York City area, if you're in this area, is the day after this podcast comes out. So if you're mm. <laughs> if you're late so you to listen to this- 24 hours. Yeah, you're too this late. Will be released and you've got 24 hours to get to my reading. My reading will be on That's September. Right. No, that's September. not right. June. My reading will be on June 24th, 2023 (laughs) at noon at McNally Jackson's Seaport location. And I will be reading a opening chapter of the book and then signing copies for anybody and chatting with anybody who wants to chat afterwards. So I hope anybody who's in the New York City area will be interested in checking that out. Before we get into our discussion on this week's episode, we like to share previous episodes comments. So Matt, what have you found in the comments for us today? There's a few comments I would wonder. Yeah, (laughs) there's a few I wanted to bring up here. A couple of them are quick. One from Dave Scott. First one of these I've watched. Turns out watching you guys chatting about Star Trek Discovery is more interesting than Star Trek Discovery. (laughs) Mm. So first, thanks for finding us, Dave. Yeah, (laughs) that's pretty funny. The next one was from Dan Sims. Knowing what is coming, I love these two episodes. This is referring to the last episode we talked about where we did the back-to-back episodes. Yeah. I love these two episodes, and I like that you guys picked up on so many subtle nuances that I didn't on my first viewing. It really is better the second time through. Yeah, it's that's like they inadvertently made a show that's better to watch twice than just once, yes. and it leaves some people cold on the first watching, so yep. they're not going to come back and see the second stuff. So, ugh. It's really, I'm finding that myself. I'm like, wow, really well constructed. And yet it didn't grab fans in the way that they were hoping. So yeah. Next comment was from Technophile. Don't read my comment until 2024. I'm going to ignore <laughs> that and I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So it says no spoilers here, but I'm watching Star Trek new worlds and it has totally changed my mind about the Klingons in discovery. I made the excuse that the producers just reimagined what Klingons are, but discovery and Star Trek new worlds overlap. So you'd think at least those series would be consistent. Nope. They changed again. Now I'm thinking maybe Klingons should look human until after the original series. So this is where I, I think we gave a little too much credit. I think you gave too much credit to this show Mm. discovery for what they did to the Klingons because clearly they didn't care. They were just doing something different, different, something new because Star Trek New Worlds just like walked away from it. I disagree. That I disagree with that sentiment. I think <laughs> the reason they've done what they've done in Strange New Worlds is uh-huh. because of backlash from Discovery. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. And if these the were last... two things were made at the same time, I would agree with yeah. you, but they weren't. So okay. So the last comment is from Jason Dum. He said, "I think the Klingon design in first season of Star Trek Discovery is cool. If you want Star Trek more realistic, then making aliens seem actually alien makes sense." Same with some other production and design choices, but the plot involving the Klingons does not make much sense. The science of Star Trek Discovery also is disappointing, not as much as the current events pretty disappointing. I was also looking forward to Star Trek Discovery when it debuted and the current events of the time highlighting why. I needed some optimistic, science-based, imaginative storytelling, and we got Star Trek Discovery instead. Guess how I feel about the first two seasons of Picard? No spoilers. (laughs) Thoroughly enjoying your conversation. Great discussion. So thanks, yeah. Jason. I, I, I get his point of view. It, it, Star Trek Discovery is kind of like timeless storytelling. It doesn't really relate to what current events actually are too much. I actually, I actually go ahead and finish your thought. I, I, I said too much. There is elements of that, but the, the basic storyline is really kind of isolated 
not only from current events, but also from kind of like the rest of Trek to a certain extent. And it, and it feels like it, they kind of had to do that because they went so far out on a limb with what actually is happening Discovery, where as Star Trek fans, you're like, how have I never heard about this thing before? And they kind right. of have to explain why we never heard about it before. So it kind of puts them on an island. So they're kind of on an island by themselves within Star Trek universe at that time. And also within the actual current events of the time of making of the show. Yeah. But I do, there are elements of current events and current thinking that are in the show for sure, but it's not as, I don't know, blatant or on the nose as a lot of Star Trek sometimes can be. Yeah. So I would say it's a little more subtle at times. And then other times with like the uh, transgender homosexual relationships, you know, that that is very much on the nose and very much in the current culture at the time of making this. So there are elements that do seep in, but it's it's not, I think, as blatant as some Star Trek gets. Yeah. And I think that one of the things for me on Discovery that is evident is that it is it feels almost more like it's born of having digested the era when Enterprise was made. Yeah. more than it is about the era in which discovery was being made because in watching discovery you are given a lot of elements that are basically you can't really trust the system to do right by everybody attempts at diplomacy may be out of date that all seems born of a of a 911 world True. to me and yeah. and it feels like all of the elements of idealism and vision and hope that are in discovery are there because they're part of the DNA of Trek and the world in which those elements are at play feels like a post nine 11 world. Mm -hmm. So it holds on to a sense of idealism. It holds on to a sense of hope, but it is also given I think it's very interesting that we have, and we'll talk about it in some detail in this conversation. This show is being produced during Trump's presidency. And at the helm of this ship, they put an unstable person who could not be trusted, who had secrets. And I think that that is very much of the era. I think that they allowed the current events to leak in, in that form. And it's, it's almost like, flying under the radar a bit. And I think as we get into today's episode, the stuff will come up. And as we move forward, it'll come up more and more because this is described as chapter two of season one. There is very clearly a breaking point, which was the last two episodes we talked about discovery. Everybody will remember from last week's discussion uses its spore drive one last time before Stamet says, I can't do this anymore. And Lorca does something onto a keypad. And this is one of those little nuggets that I missed completely on first watching, but he goes in and does something to navigation as they are making their final jump. And then they end up in a place where they do not know where they are. It does not make any sense to them. So that's where we find ourselves as we leap into the discussion on this week's episode, despite yourself. Before I go on much further, that sound in the background is, of course, the read alert, which means it's time for Matt to tackle the Wikipedia description. Matt, take it away. Okay. Despite yourself, that's the name of the episode. That's not a sentence. Discovery's mm -hmm. crew determines that they have arrived at a parallel mirror universe with Stamets now unconscious and unable to power the spore drive. Tyler confronts Laurel. She attempts to use a verbal cue to trigger something within him, though he fights it off. They find a data core in the wreckage of a Klingon ship and learn that this universe is ruled by the human Terran Empire, who are fighting a resistance that includes species such as Klingons and Vulcans. And here, Burnham is the former captain of the ISS Shenzo, presumed dead after an attack by a fugitive Lorca. The ISS Discovery is captained by Sylvia Tilly's counterpart, so Tilly and the crew pretend to be their mirror selves. They deliver Burnham and Lorca to the Shenzo under the ruse that Burnham has been hunting Lorca since her presumed death and has now captured him. Colbert informs Tyler that he also appears to have undergone major surgical modifications, which trigger something in Tyler and he kills Colbert. Tyler joins the others on the Shenzo where Lorca is tortured while Burnham assumes command. You got to love Wikipedia descriptions, spending as much time as they do on the fact that Tilly tries to talk to an unconscious Stamets, but then is very hand wavy about the fact that Tyler kills Culber. 
<laughs> oh yeah and then he kills him because you know <laughs> post hypnotic yada yada yeah. despite yourself directed by jonathan frakes if nobody knows who jonathan frakes is why you're you clearly to listening to the wrong podcast yes and i have some thoughts about jonathan frakes's directorial decisions in this episode one scene in particular okay Written by Sean Cochran. This episode aired on January 7th, 2018. And we have our usual cast of characters. Sinequa Martin Green as Michael Burnham. Doug Jones as Saru. Shazid Latif as Ash Tyler. Anthony Rapp as Paul Stamets. Mary Wiseman as Sylvia Tilly. Jason Isaacs as Catherine Gabriel Lorca. And Wilson Cruz as the aforementioned doctor who is killed in this episode. And what was the world like January 7th, 2018 when this episode dropped? Well, Matt, believe it or not, you ended 2017 dancing along to Post Malone's Rockstar featuring 21 Savage. Guess what? It was still the number one song. You were still dancing along to it. That's right. Rockstar by Post Malone and the movies. What were we lining up to see? Well, this is interesting, I think. Oh, boy. Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle had been released in December of 2017, but it took three weeks for it to hit the number one spot. So I think that's very interesting that a movie could sit and build an audience over time. Clearly this time of year with the holidays, with time off from school, audiences were taking families, kids were going to the movies. So Jumanji, welcome to the jungle hit number one. That's third week of release making 37 million. It's the 2017 American fantasy adventure comedy film directed by Jake Kasdan from a screenplay by Chris McKenna. Eric Summers, Scott Rosenberg, and Jeff Pinker. The film is the second installment in the Jumanji Films series. It's a sequel to Jumanji 1995. It stars Dwayne Johnson, Jack Black, Kevin Hart, Karen Gillan, Nick Jonas, and Bobby Cannavale. And on television, what were we watching? Well, once again, we're trying to compare apples to apples and not look at ratings numbers via Nielsen, but it's getting harder because information at this point with streaming programming Streamers don't often share numbers. So it's a lot of estimates. It's a lot of information based on assumptions in some cases. And sources that I've found to provide information from one year don't always do it a following year. So I had a very nice list that did a really nice job of compiling 2017's viewership. I'm having a little bit more difficulty with 2018, but I have found some information around what are the most binged programs for 2018. Mm -hmm. So in trying to compare apples to apples and say, okay, what were people watching heavily and in repetition compared to a show like discovery, which would also be able to deliver that kind of experience. You could binge discovery in the same way that you could binge these programs. And the number one program for binge watching in 2018 was a little program called friends. Matt, you and I used to talk about this when we were watching discover or enterprise. Yes. And it was one of the top programs and then it ended. And I thought, well, good. I don't have to ever say the word friends again, but here we are friends, which was available at this point in 2018 on Netflix was getting about 2.3% of all viewers at any given time. So that is, I mean, it's a juggernaut. It's a monster. You can't, you can't ignore it. So We'll see what number two was next week. And in the news, well, I've already given a hint about what era we were living in at this point. In early January 2018, there was a little news story in the New York Times about Trump (laughs) defending his mental fitness by saying he was, quote, a very stable genius. So (laughs) when I say that this era may have leaked into discovery in the form of a somewhat unreliable an unstable captain in Gabriel Lorca. This is the kind of leadership I'm referring to. Lorca is a very stable genius. He's a very stable genius. Also in the news were news articles about how the U.S. intelligence agencies had underestimated North Korea. For decades, they had warned that North Korea was making progress on a missile that could reach the United States, but the last breakthroughs happened faster than expected. And also... India's economic woes are piercing Modi's Modi's aura of invulnerability. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's policies are being criticized as India's hot economy cools, but with society so 
polarized, his Hindu base still appears solid. This, I think, is important because this is a news story from 2018, and he is still in power to this day. So this episode, I do appreciate one thing about this episode. Within the first five minutes, they're like, Mm -hmm. hey, we're in the mirror universe. They just very quickly are like, bing, 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 bang. Quantum signatures aren't the right. The the quantum signatures of the things around us don't match with the ship. And that's not possible. If we're in our universe, oh my gosh, we must be in a parallel universe. They want to get this out of the way as quickly as possible to be able to get to the plot. It is not labored. I really did appreciate that. So very quickly, they hit the, like, we're in a merry, merry universe. Then we enter a scene, which is what I wanted to mention before, the directorial decisions about Jonathan Frakes. There is a scene in which everybody is looking at a holographic display of Lorca's research into the jumps and his discovery of the parallel universes and the timelines. He describes his hope with Stamets to eventually have explored these. The choice made of having the camera swivel around the three participants in the conversation and jump to focus on whoever's talking while rotating behind the other two. I literally got dizzy. <laughs> I remember getting dizzy the first time I watched this episode. I got dizzy this time watching this episode. I did not. I do not like yeah. that as a technique. I, I, That's I, all I have to say about his directorial choices. I think he does a wonderful job for the rest of the episode, but that scene in particular, oy, hand well, me my motion sickness pills. Yeah, I, I did not have the problem. There's one thing about this scene I did want to call out that I really liked how you were talking about how like they ripped the bandaid off of we're in a mirror universe. Now let's yeah. go. I appreciated that. The other thing I appreciated was we talked about already before how there were so many hints dropped over the first half chapter one of season one that Lorca is not what he seems and there's mm-hmm. something else going on. They've been leading that way through very subtle hints and the first more obvious hint is the last second navigation thing that he yes. puts in. That's the first time as a viewer, if you caught that, would be like, what's he doing? Yeah. I didn't catch that. But this scene has the first like rip the bandaid off. Lorca's outright lying. Yeah. In this scene, when he says, I talked to Stamets and he was very excited to work with me to explore this where yes. we as viewers know the last scene we had on the, the, the deck where the two of them were talking, Stamets was like, I'm out. I'm not doing anything with this anymore. So it's like, it was very clear that he's lying here. So now we know Lorca is a liar. It is very helpful to remember. It is very helpful to have spotted and hold on to his control of the data pad. Yeah. In the last episode without that, this is, he's just lying. But with that, you're like, he did something here. He brought them here. So this is now the first moment, not only is he lying, but you're like, he's manipulating everything that's going on and he's largely responsible for what's happening here. This is also in this episode, I think one of the, the, again, I think the writing here is super terrific and subtle and pushing forward in a very natural way. He is so fixated on keeping Burnham safe. Yes. That she has to argue with him about her relationship to what has to be done and saying, if I'm not here to do these things that I know about, why am I here? So here we have a captain who is overly protective of something that is seen as an asset. He is doing things to take the ship and to places where everybody else is in the dark, but he clearly did something. And now he is lying actively to the people around him. And he has made a pattern of saying like, I need people I can trust. I pull in people I can trust. I need that. And he has pulled in Ash Tyler. Ash Tyler at this point has had a full on PTSD breakdown in the previous episode. And here he continues to have flashbacks. He is hiding this from everybody except for Burnham, whom he shares this with. And he asks her for leeway and let me figure out what's going on with myself. Let me do this in my way. He convinces her of this in what I think is a very tender and loving scene. And really this episode does a lot in taking their relationship forward in a huge way and in a huge way that if you kind of blink at a certain point, it seems very lovely and natural. But if the blink I'm talking about is 
if you ignore the fact that he kills somebody on yeah. the ship because yeah. he kills somebody on discovery. And then by the end of the episode, they're having this loving moment and you think, Oh, they're really there for each other. And you have to remind yourself. Yeah. Hold no, he's on. He's a killer. Yeah. He's he killed killer. the doctor before they yeah. left. So well, I remember this the, conversation the is going to be a lot of back and forth. I think, I don't think we have to, yeah. I don't think we have to withhold information in the form of spoilers or confine ourselves to a direct a to z plot well, when it comes to in this one when it comes to the, the tyler killing the doctor and then tyler at the end i remember the first time my wife and i watched this when it was first aired both of us were like audibly saying oh god I, like we were terrified for her because you yeah. know he's this killer that could snap at any moment and you yes. think that he might turn on her of course she's part of the reason that he's not turning into the secret agent that the right. Laurel was trying to turn him into. Yes. But we don't know at this point. So it's, it's, yeah. there, there's interesting things that they're doing with Tyler. It, it stretches believability for me a little bit because he Let's was talk so about this, this aspect of the show yeah. at this point, but go ahead and just launch into what you were saying. Cause he was so on the edge during the opening sequence where he's trying to go get the Klingon data core from the debris and has a breakdown there. And the only thing that keeps him on point is when, uh, Burnham talks him over the radio and talks him down. Everybody knows this. Everybody's recognizing this. The entire bridge crew recognizes something's not right here. Lorca comments on it. Like everybody's aware that he's un coming unhinged. And yet Lorca picks him. It's like, it doesn't quite make sense why he would have done that. Yeah. Even, even needing somebody he can trust. It didn't make sense why he went along with that. The second issue was I had was it was awfully convenient that he was alone with a doctor in the medical bay to kill him. Yeah. No other patients, no nurses, like nobody around to see him to stop twisting the guys in and out of there in every other scene. Yeah. Correct. It's like, this is the only scene where suddenly it's ghost town and nobody's around. And at this point, the doctor knows he is not who he says he is. He knows this. Yeah. He, wouldn't he be knows alone this. With him. It's not yeah. a, I'm not quite sure what's going on. He's like, they reshaped your bones. They like changed you from something into what you are now. You are not Tyler. He knows that. He doesn't know why, but he knows that. How yeah. is he so casual and comfortable to be talking to a man that is clearly not who he says he is? Yeah. He would have had somebody else there. He would have had security there. It's like there's there's so many uh, issues I have with the way that scene was set up. I'm not, I, I don't have a problem with him. The murder, because I was interesting storytelling. It's great, great tension that pays off over the coming season. But it's just one of those, the way it was set up to me felt a little hand wavy and a little... Yeah. um thin it didn't it didn't hold together for me yeah for me i think this is a great demonstration of something we always complained about in enterprise yeah which was if you're going to have a character show up to be disposed of having them show up unexpectedly in one episode only to die in that episode is telegraphing what's coming this was a killing of a character that you do not anticipate because the doctor of course the doctor of the ship is going to be a character a recurring character and of course if it's going to be a recurring character if you get an actor like wilson cruz to play that character this is a well-known actor this is an established guy so for him to make an appearance in multiple episodes, he's not always in every episode, but he's also the partner of one of the main characters. Like this is a guy who's going to be around. So the murder, I think is a storytelling element is fantastic. It is, mm -hmm. and it is gripping and it is harrowing in that moment leading up to the murder as illogical as you point out, why is nobody else in the medical bay? Are they having this conversation super late at night? What is like, what is the setup here that makes this work? Waving that away, the conversation I felt did a fantastic job of charging it up with you are not who you think you are. I don't know what you are because the entire thing is we've taken a look at you from the perspective of did the Klingons do something to put something into Ash Tyler? And now the doctor has taken a different approach, which is did somebody take something and put Ash Tyler on top of it? And he has identified that the scar tissue, the psychological scarring, the things that he's identifying, he's like, are consistent with imprinting as opposed to subverting. So he re that conversation, as he's revealing these things, I felt it charging up the room in a really fantastic way. And I really loved the depiction of that moment. And when the killing comes, it happens in the blink of an eye and it happens in the way that 
Tyler in that moment appears both there and not there. It's sociopathic. Mm -hmm. And his goal then is revealed later because what he reveals in his conversation with Burnham is no matter what else happens, you need to survive and I will be the one to protect you regardless of what it means to survive here, what it means to be here, whether we ever get home again, you will survive because I will make sure you survive. So he kills the doctor in that moment so that he can go on the mission because mm -hmm. he has to protect her. It is a level of devotion that it goes beyond romantic interest between hu two it's humans. Like <laughs> it's stalkerish and it yeah. is depicted as the latter part of the episode where the prior part of the episode is all about him and Laurel and him going into conversations with Laurel. Some of them that seemed fantasized, some of them that are literal, but those conversations revealing what am I, what did you do to me? You know what you are, she says. And then they both begin to speak Klingon and his depiction of Klingon is not a human depiction no, given what no. we've seen in discovery. He is speaking as a Klingon. So this is the, we then get in this episode, they give us all the equation that we need before the equal sign. They're like this plus this equals. And then they yeah. don't say it. They yeah. don't say what it equals. And I'm not going to say what it equals either, but they're giving us all the parts. So if you are an astute viewer at this point, you are sitting there saying, I know what, I know what this is. I know what has happened for mm -hmm. me. One of the big leaps in this episode and in this series at this point in season one of discovery, I had an issue with the Klingon's ability to do this. I did not, yes. Yes. I did not like it as a, as a part of the show. I was just like, this doesn't work for me. And having said that, and I mentioned this last week, there are elements of discovery that as much as I don't like them, I still like them. So yep. I don't like the fact that this is depicted now as the Klingon's ability to do this because this is something that doesn't fit, I don't think, with what we know of the Klingons in the future. And there is, of course, the opportunity to say discovery is taking place a long time before next generation. So the Klingons of next generation may have a different definition of what it means to be honorable, what it means to be Klingon. They may be redefining it in, in ways over a hundred plus years where they're saying like, we are Klingon. So this is what we do. And we would never use subterfuge. That's mm -hmm. one of the key things about Klingons in the next generation era is they talk about to be Klingon means to boldly go forward as a Klingon, present yourself as a Klingon. We do not use subterfuge. We do not use trickery and and spy craft is not something that is utilized by the Klingons the way it is used by Romulans. That is one of the reasons why Klingons view Romulans as dishonorable. So this level of we've taken somebody and we've turned them into a human, we've imprinted a personality on top of them to, to well, create a Starfleet officer to do this thing does not feel like it is within the same realm but, as the later. I would Klingons. disagree. But again, I, I would disagree. I could, I could be wrong. Because this does not feel like a Klingon society decision to do this. This was Laurel and Laurel yeah. has been set up as coming from the house of thieves and liars. She is yeah. duplicitous. She's not her entire family is not to be trusted. She's an outcast of Klingon society because her family is considered a bunch of thieves and liars. Right. She, and we've seen her do this over the entire series so far, where she will basically say whatever she, she's like Gaius from Battlestar Galactica. She will say whatever she needs to do at that moment to weasel out of whatever situation she, she's in. So it makes sense that she would have been pushing to do whatever this thing is that they did to Tyler, because she's trying to do this duplicitous subterfuge. That's what she's all about. So it makes sense from a personal Klingon point of view, not a Klingon capital K kind of like yeah. point of view. Yeah. So it's like, I don't think this flies in the face of what we know of Klingons at all. Um, but I do agree with you. The, the technology and the ability to do this is like, what the hell? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> if they could have done this back in here, it's like, why have we never heard about this before? It's like, it yeah. seems kind of crazy that this is a technique that was doable hundreds of years before every other show we've ever seen. Yeah. And it's on par with it. the spore drive itself. 
it's yeah, like it's well these crazy. are technologies that are wild and like yeah. if you could do this but to to lean back into what you just said about like individual klingon actions versus klingon societal actions i do i do appreciate that as as an aspect of this and i do agree that that does explain a good portion of like my my con- not confusion but just it's wild because when we're watching these episodes, what I have is the experience of, huh, that doesn't make sense, but fine. Right. I find myself like making a footnote as I'm moving forward in the episode and I'm like, but that's fine. And, and that I think is a testament to the writing, the performance, the directing, like they're convincing you that, yeah, some of these things don't mesh, but you know what? You're still enjoying the story. And so it's working in that way. It would not work in a lesser way program or a lesser movie i just last night watched a film which arguably had a lifetime movie plot (laughs) but it was written and directed by an incredibly accomplished director so despite the fact that is effectively a lifetime movie plot it is so well told that it's captivating and it was an enjoyable watch so i think that's some of what's happening here, the talent and skill going into some of the storytelling is good enough to make a hardcore Trek fan accept things that don't easily mesh with what we know or what we anticipate. And mm-hmm. they are of course walking on a razor's edge because they've set up a show. That's a prequel again to the original series. So if this was all taking place a thousand years after next generation, we mm-hmm. would be like, Hey, Trek is in the far future now, but they've put themselves in a position of you're going to be judged against not only the original series, but literally enterprise. Yeah. And one of the things that I wanted to point out briefly before we move on to what I think should be the last part of our conversation, I hope everybody picked up on, they refer to the defiant. Yes. And the defiant was the, one of my favorite stories from enterprise right at the end when they had a whole, Oh, you know, the defiant in the original series that got pulled through a Tholian web and it disappeared. Turns out that was into the mirror universe in the past. And that entire storyline is referenced here. I loved the fact that they're like, yeah, we've got this thing we've identified. It must be the defiant. How is that possible? Well, it's from our era, but it went into the past of this universe. So if we can get a hold of something like it becomes this whole, uh, yeah. layers of like, yeah, oh, we're, seeing, so cool. we're seeing the like, ramifications. We're seeing the ramifications of what happened in enterprise happen now. And it's like, it's, it's, it's really cool. I did. I yeah. did love that call. Very back, cool. That very, tight very nice fan servicey stuff, especially yeah. like, like, come on, they're referring back to a show that nobody really watched. Yeah. I mean, it's like Trek is Trek. Like they're mm-hmm. like, yeah, so the right people will know what we're talking yeah. about. Like how yeah. did the Defiant end up here for a lot of people? It's going to be like, Oh, the Defiant is another spaceship. It must have been another spaceship. Yep. But to that audience that watched enterprise and the original series and makes these connections, it's one of those, like, this is so cool moments. So the last thing I want to end on, we've, we've talked about, Lorca, duplicity, plans within plans. We've talked about Burnham, who in this episode largely takes kind of a back seat. She is involved yeah. in making arguments of like what we have to do and what's appropriate, but she is there in support of Lorca's agenda of how do we get back to our universe. He makes the argument with her. Here's what we need to do. We need to do this auspicious act of masquerading as this universe is Burnham who is assumed dead and this universe is Lorca who is a fugitive and a rebel against the intergalactic, the, the interplanetary fascist human empire will masquerade as the two of them to get aboard the Shenzhou. You as captain of the Shenzhou will have access to files. You will get on the information you need about the defiance so that we can figure out a way to get home. So, That plan is supported by Burnham, but it's Lorca's plan. Burnham is in support of Tyler, who we've already talked about. He's having, he starts off at bad and only goes Mm -hmm. downhill from there. He starts off with, yeah, remember last week I had a PTSD breakdown. Now I'm having a breakdown in space as I'm flying through Klingon wreckage. I am having flashbacks to sexual or surgical experiences 
that involve Laurel that I don't understand. I am speaking fluent Klingon the way a Klingon talks. I am doing all these things. So I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to ask the doctor, help me, doc. You got to figure out if they did something to me. Oh, you figured it out. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And then it ends with him saying to Burnham, I will be the protector you need. And she says, I will be yours. So they are now like full blown. Mm -hmm. Like they've committed themselves to each other and then go to bed. So the episode ends with her aboard the Shenzhou with him as her bodyguard. And they are in bed together making this promise of if the mirror universe is where we have to be, we will survive because of each other. And he is a killer. And we know that, and he is yep. not what he appears to be. And we know that. So all of that is incredible drama with Burnham being largely in the kind of background role in these, in this, these story elements to say, I'm here for you guys to support you guys in your efforts. And then there's Tilly. And we just talked <laughs> yes. for a few minutes about the depiction of Tilly, Captain uh, Tilly. I love it. <laughs> this episode where it is determined that she in the mirror universe as a result of the likelihood being creating romantic relationships with superior officers and offing them at various stages so that as a young woman, cause it is cadet Kelly, uh, cadet Tilly as a young woman, she is already a captain. She's a captain of the discovery in the mirror universe. And she has a multitude of nicknames that all refer to the fact that she is a dangerous dangerous individual. So what did you think of two things? Uh -huh. The actress's depiction oh, yes. of this version of a very uncertain Tilly. And we're talking about Mary Wiseman. What did you think about Mary Wiseman's depiction of Tilly through this entire episode? And what did you think of cadet Tilly's depiction of oh, it's Captain Killer? It, it, brilliant would not be an understatement. <laughs> it was, I just, this is my favorite part of the entire show was watching this squirrelish, like she's talks a lot when she gets nervous and finding out that she's actually the captain. And I love the way they thrust her into the captain's chair to talk to the other ship because they're like, mm. it can't be Lorca. It's gotta be you. And when they shove her in, they're like, don't you understand? I talk so much the way that it reminded me a little bit of Han Solo from Star the first Star Wars movie when he things like gets on the radio. Here. Things, and things are, are all fine. fine. How are you? How, how are you? <laughs> it reminded me a little bit of that where it's like it is so rough and so off and she, she barely pulls it off, but it works. Especially when like she's talking to them. They're like, why? Why aren't you on the view screen? And she's like, uh, it's um, it's broken. Um, technical. Let me technical get you my errors. engineer. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> she's just basically like call, calling it quits. Like I can't do this. I thought her depiction of what a squirrelish Tilly would be like in trying to depict this cold blooded killer Tilly, I thought it was great. I thought it was so much fun. And as an actor, I think she was probably having a blast with this polar opposite portrayal. But it's also fun because like they they've shown that Tilly wants to be a captain. Like she made the statement, yeah. I want to be a captain. So it's like it's clearly in her in both universes to do this, but one is clearly got more confidence <laughs> yeah. in pulling it off, and the other one doesn't have that confidence yet. I loved it. It was it was great tension and comedy. So it like it did a great job pulling off both things. Yeah. And it did it in a way that felt very trek. I thought oh, it yeah. was, yeah. it, it was reminiscent of those moments where you take some, some character who, you know, and you know them as they've got their little fiefdom that they operate well in and you plop them into something well deeper than what they're accustomed to. And I'm thinking of some of the fantastic scenes between like Odo and Quark where mm -hmm. like the darkest storylines are deep space nine storylines. There's, there are seasons of that show, which are about an era of Trek, which is, is very dark. And the two of them along with Garrick will have conversations where it will lighten the mood of an episode for just long enough for you to catch your breath. And that's what she's doing in this one. I love yep. that the prep involves, they, they decide that they're going to masquerade the entire ship. They repaint the ship. And they can do all of this apparently like within a matter of hours, but they repaint the ship so that it is now gold. It is 
they suit up all of the officers uh, apparently with you know replicating new uniforms even new communicators for them so they no longer look like standard starfleet communicators they now look like the symbol of the iss you end up with armor on everybody so it's got a sort of uh, the human empire the terran empire is kind of portrayed in this as having a pseudo uh you know roman look is always part of the the mythos of it in any depiction of the the mirror universe but in particular i just kept thinking about like how how klingon it was for them yeah. to be wearing the armor in the way they do there's a fantastic segment when they go into the alternate universes shenzu and burnham's previous navigator oh, yeah. is now captain and he is clearly upset at the fact that burnham has returned the very moment that he sees her on a hollow projection he kind of in stunned silence says it's you you're back she plays this whole game of i wanted everybody to think i was dead so that i could pursue pursue lorca and get a hold of him and now i've got him and then they go to the ship and he is constantly undercut by her burnham plays it perfectly to be able mm-hmm. to play this aggressive captain who is defending her terrain and she is taking hold of shenzu again right out from underneath him and there is a moment in one of the lifts where he says you know they i made sure that everybody bowed when i took command when, I, when you disappeared and i was able to take command i made sure everybody bowed but they never bowed quite as deeply as they did for you and i think i figured out how to fix that I, and attacks her i thought this was an amazing scene leading up to that scene another thing that was led up to this was as they're coming off the transporter pad and she's making eye contact with the different people in the room as she's walking out all of them they all with their around. eyes they're all yeah. terrified of her yeah. and i love that they that was happening and then the look on burnham's face when she, you can see her recognizing of like a oh crap like they're terrified of me. What I loved so, about that too yeah. is it's a callback to Burnham's arrival and discovery. She was the traitor. Yeah. And as she went everywhere, everybody avoided eye contact. So it's yeah. back to the same response, but for a very different reason. Very different reason. It was she but, was judged as a traitor previously. Now she's walking to an environment where nobody wants to look at her again. But it's yes. not because of traitordom, but it's because she is such a badass and she's reading that so perfectly and by the time the fight in the turbo lift starts my first thought was this guy's a goner because we've seen her fight to fight. a standstill with saru and we've seen yeah. her kill a klingon like we like we know that she knows how to take care of herself so yeah. in this fight in the turbo lift <laughs> i think that it's you know star trek <laughs> fights are always fun because depending on the era like an enterprise you got uh, oh man slow me moving klingons waving batless clumsily in the air so that the the starfleet officers could run up and go punch punch and somehow knock a klingon out yeah, this this is not in that. the original series you had kirk at every opportunity ripping his shirt and a lot of what looked like tumbling tumbling yeah. classes where it's like Con and yes. kirk are tumbling around the engineering room this looks like a brutal fight well, the other a thing very about, small co- it's in very a very well, small quarter yeah, it's very well choreographed, the entire sequence. But the part that just stood out for me was when she's getting choked and she's realized she can't reach the knife and she kicks open that panel and recognizes the thing and kicks it and it causes the turbo lift to kind of reverse direction or something really quickly. I don't know if you picked up on it, but as they're flying up and the camera's above them and they're coming towards the camera, he's looking like, oh crap. And the look on her face is like, I got this. It yeah. was like, it was exactly what she wanted to happen. And I just love the fact that it looked like she's in control. He has no idea what to do right now. Yeah. It was like in that moment, you knew, oh, she's got this because she, won she, the fight. she was yeah. trying to do this. And I was just yeah. like, I just love the whole portrayal of this just all out brawl that would look brutal. And just her not only just out, fighting him but just outsmarting him she outsmarted him in that fight the way that it ends with her stabbing him and her doing it because she had to yeah the way she twists the knife yes like oh she knows she has to kill him there is no has to kill him him. she has to kill him but then then she's in shock opening and she turns around and she falls out and the entire crew sees this body fall out and she's standing there in shock I did like how it was came it came across to me as here's Burnham 
knowing she's in shock, a little bit of the Vulcan in her coming through of like, I have to maintain control even yeah. though I want to freak out right now. And just witnessing all of the shock on the faces of the people on the, the bridge looking here and then the slow applause. I just thought this this entire sequence, it fits so perfectly for this mirror universe. It's yeah. exactly what they expect. And like the fact that the way she portrayed it and held it together was so well done. I love this yeah. entire sequence. And Tilly's involvement in fulfilling the role of yeah. the arrogant, aggressive captain reluctantly at first and then warming up to it and practicing. And in the scene where she's finally put on her full uniform and says something to the effect of, well, let's go take care of these assholes. And then looks around like, is that a problem? And Lorca is proud of her in that moment. Like, no, yes, you're doing exactly what you need to be doing. Even yeah. Lorca's imitation of a Irish engineer, a little bit of a, a winking That's his actual to, accent. to Scotty. Yeah, where he, yeah. he leans into, oh, we got a wee bit of a problem. And it's this whole, like, like is any of this going to work? He's got an expression on his face. Like, I hope this gets us yeah. out of here. Um the whole depiction of how Tilly leans into aggression, even with the crew, she has to stay in character. So mm -hmm. she's barking at people, even though there are no other mirror universe people around, she has to do that for herself. So she's being mean to the people around her. And it's a demonstration. I think for us, as you mentioned, this is a character who wants to be a captain. And she's leaning a little bit into like, I'm uncertain about my ability to do this, but she's learning that she can. And so that's, I think, a really great turn for that character. Mm -hmm. So we end the episode. There was a part of me that I was almost ready to say, like, should we view this as a two-parter? But then I realized this isn't really a cliffhanger ending. This is just no. the opening of a new chapter. So that's why this discussion has been limited to one episode as opposed to last week where we dealt with it as a two-parter. What we are left with here is not a how will they get out, but how will this continue? Because we're left with Lorca in a torture chamber. That looks terrible. That's the first depiction of the torture chambers in the mirror universe where it legitimately looks terrible. Yes. The depiction yes. of it in the enterprise episode was largely like, Oh, it's a phone booth, but here we see it. And it's, it legitimately like the effects now are able to do things that reveal skeleton underneath and the electricity and energy pouring through the body. And Lorca looks largely incapable of having any kind of coherent thought at this moment. He has gone so far as to actually slam his own face into a door in order to break his nose and break the skin and be wounded. So it looks like Burnham took him, took him down, but we are left with him in a torture chamber, Burnham and Tyler rolling around on a bed. Tyler of course is just hours away from having killed the doctor. And the discovery is largely playing a hiding game of like, we've got to pretend we're this badass crew doing all these terrible things where what we're really doing is waiting for Burnham and Lorca, hopefully to come back with information about the defiant. So this is less of a cliffhanger. How will they get out of this problem as much as it is they're in a new circumstance and they're now exploring this new world a little bit. So mm -hmm. that's why this is a single episode conversation as opposed to the beginning of a two-parter. So next time we're going to be talking about the episode, the wolf inside. And once again, I encourage people to jump in the comments. What do you expect to see in the wolf inside wrong answers only. And before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you'd like to remind our listeners about what do you have coming up on your main channel? Uh, right now I'm in the middle of my UK nuclear fusion tour. The second video in the series of three videos is out now. And so if you're interested in fusion and seeing what's happening, Definitely check this one out. As for me, please check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can find out more information about my books. You can also find them directly at whatever bookstore, which includes Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org, or your local bookstore or public library. 
Don't forget that I do have some events coming up in the coming weeks. I have my launch event at McNally Jackson Seaport in Manhattan on the 24th. And I will also have some events coming up in July, including one in New Jersey. I'll provide more information as that becomes available. If you'd like to support the show, please do consider reviewing us on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever it was you found this podcast, go back there, like us, leave a review, and don't forget to subscribe, share us with your friends. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click the become a supporter button. It allows you to throw some coins at our heads. And when you do that, not only do you leave a bruise, you also automatically become an ensign, which means you will be subscribed to our spinoff show, Out of Time, in which we talk about anything that doesn't fit within the confines of this program. So it might be other Trek, it might be Star Wars, it might be fantasy, horror, it might be comics, movies, or TV shows, whatever it is that catches our fancy. All of that really helps support the show. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening or watching, and we'll talk to you next time.